and, and how much Fleur there is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you for those of you who've shown up. Uh, as Greg said, your reward is a lecture. And, and the, the lecture today is going to be different than a lot of pretty much every other lecture, both that I've given and other people have been giving over the course of the school, largely because it's the last day. And I f I'm lecturing about a topic which is, by the standards of all the rest of the biophysics things we've talked about here, is pretty much in its infancy. Right? There's not, we don't have the huge, nice, developed sets of theories. And so there's a tendency, and I'm going to give in to that tendency, to want to try and move something a little bit more valedictory. Actually think about sort of where a particular challenging problem where we don't really have much of an insight yet, and to sort of try and think about it a little bit. And in general, sort of you at 9 a.m. on a Friday morning, you get to sort of be part of my therapy session, talking about <laughs> sort of work, working through a particular set of uh, scientific problems that I've been thinking about a lot, and in particular, thinking about measuring social behavior. And we'll sort of talk, and what we're going to talk about is why this is a particularly challenging type of problem, and where this is, sort of, I think, an area where we can sort of build on and think a little bit about. And hopefully by the end, it'll build towards something where we can think about sort of more philosophically maybe where we are sort of in the state of thinking about theories of behavior and as biophysicists and sort of how we might be able to move forward. So, all right, let's start. Again, you should think of this today less of a review article, more a perspective piece. So you'll hear all sorts of things about things I don't know about and how to solve, and that's the fun. All right. So one of the things really over the last year and a half we've gotten really good at is tracking behavior. Right, so these are a bunch of deep network uh, inspired images where people can go and you can track these guys like the hand of a mouse reaching for something or this fly in this part of a courtship behavior or the complicated background or this vole or these hundred odd uh, zebrafish all swimming around. And we've gotten really good at this. Like this is something really that's really over the last maybe 18 months that has made a lot of things possible that weren't before. So these are a bunch of technical problems solved. But when you think about the technical problems, what still remains are the conceptual ones. Right. How do you actually go and measure behavior in these types of things? We've talked in the last three, three days about different ways you might do that, given these. But this is all looking at, with the exception of the lower right-hand corner, all looking at one animal at a time. But what we can then see is that there's a lot of examples where now that when there's more than one animal, our problem becomes exponentially more difficult and even in some ways becomes a fundamentally different problem to state. So whether you have a like, case of two pair bonded prairie voles up here, so there, here there's, there's, some, uh, there's, some, uh, there's a notion of pair bondedness, or you have courtship with the flies, you have the female fly and the male fly trying to do what male flies generally try and do. <laughs> or, or you have some maternal behavior, like the cute little river otters here. Or you can even see sometimes social behavior doesn't even require another animal direct, directly in the image. For here's this poor bird of paradise just sitting here trying, trying his hardest to get somebody there. This is a social behavior. If you didn't know something about the context, you wouldn't know this was a social behavior. Maybe he's, just, maybe he's just a filter feeder or something. <laughs> I don't know, right? <laughs> I mean, the, the idea is there's th this notion of social behavior is something that we find very intuitive. And when we look at these things, we can, there's sort of this notion of we know what social behavior is. But when you're putting numbers on it and actually trying to define what that is, things get very difficult very quickly. And I'm going to try and go through some examples and talk about why this might be so difficult. So let me ask this, actually. So, why, so we talked at the beginning about why social behavior, about why behavior was so difficult. What are some particular things about social behavior that might make it hard to put precise numbers on? It's 9 a.m. I need some work from you guys. Yeah, Liam. Uh, 
Right, right. So that's, that's great. So if we have like, y is so clearly one is right. So when du when during a time series of two animals doing something. When actually is that social interaction occurring? Right? That's not necessarily obvious. And it's not even obvious necessarily always looking at something that an interaction is happening. Or maybe it's obvious if you measure in one set of variables, but in another set of variables it won't be obvious at all. Right, so this is obviously one big aspect. Any other thoughts? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Right, that, those are two great ones, right? So it's high dimensional. Now, behavior in general is high dimensional, but now you have, it's even higher dimensional, and there's two animals, and so multi minimally that should go up by some, by some quadratic polynomial in terms of the complexity, right? And it's high dimensional, and then the other point is, you're, so, and this sort of relates to the first point, is that there's internal hidden states which are usually the thing we actually care about, right? We care about, for example, the probability that, say, the female, the female will accept a male advance if we're looking at a courtship behavior, right? This is, that probability is not encoded in the behavior we see. It's some inference, right? And maybe it's some internal decision to abound problem where she's taking information from the environment and deciding no, 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 yes, yes, uh, yes, or, or it eventually gets down to no or something along those lines. Okay. So, but there's some internal state which is not the thing we're able to directly measure. Great. Any other thoughts? You are rarely in large animals. Yes, right, right. N, N greater than 1, N not much, much greater than 1, <laughs> right. As physicists, one, we can usually solve. Two, take some work, and we can usually get there. Three is theoretically impossible. And then Avogadro's number we can handle. <laughs> right. So but the problem is the problem is like two or three usually are a lot of work. Right. Even we don't even know what to do with two electrons in, in, in terms of an exact solution. Right? So so this is so this is sort of a regime where thinking like a physicist is difficult right? because there's, we're not able to do a full-fledged coarse graining. Like there's unlikely to be a real, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's unlikely you're going to get a renormalization group to understand what two animals are doing. Right? Be nice if you could do it. Let me know. Uh, but I, it's unlikely. Right, so, and so th these are the ones I had. Uh, oh, well, there's a couple other. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I, exactly right. So you're anthropomorphizing, and that really comes in when you're looking at this, right? And I'm going to show some, like, because I've, as I've been doing throughout, we'll go back and look at some things in the biology literature. And this is sort of people will say, oh, the animal is courting now. And so I'm going to call it courting, and I'm going to measure a courtship index, which is how often I think it's courting. Right. So yeah, but that, and that's exactly right. Any other? Yeah. Right, well, yeah, so let's even just, right, so if you have like three animals there, it's not clear who's interacting with whom, but let's even just worry about the problem of I have two animals, right? I have two animals, right? They're either interacting or they're not, right? And so we don't have this, and maybe sort of the corollary of this is we don't have a definition of what an interaction is. And that's really what a lot of today is going to be about is can we get a notion of this? Ahmed. Let's let's come let let's come back to that later, okay. right? Greg, do you have something? Can I add a positive thing, or is that yeah? Only thing? No, positive is great. So the positive thing is that with one animal, or even with an animal and a stimulus, it's very hard to know that you're in a natural condition. You put two animals. 
levels, and they interact with each other, and it's much more mm -hmm. engaging for them. So there's some benefit for all. Of right, right. So I mean, and that, that and that's exactly. I mean, so what I didn't say is why. We, and maybe I should have, is why we care. Right? In some sense, it's obvious why we care about these, because we're seeing these, this is a huge and important part of an animal's life. Right? Ours and all of these animals, right? This is, these are all things which are ethologically and evolutionarily essential for their survival. And so uh, when you put these animals in social context, you're getting, as Greg says, much more naturalistic and in some sense interesting behavior. But how to quantify what that interesting means, that's the, the really difficult part. Another thing I would add is it's in space, right? So what's the first thing we did whenever we had our analyses before? It was that we made it translationally and rotationally invariant, right? That's no longer, right? That, that's no longer going to be relevant, right? The fact me saying something right here and me getting up in somebody's face, those are two very different behaviors, <laughs> right? right so, so space matters here, right? And we can ignore it. And that's going to be one thing which is going to show up a lot. And what it, I mean, to put it in the most mundane matter, s dealing with space is the most annoying unit conversion problem you can think of. <laughs> yeah, Hawkman. Right, so I would put that into this category of when is it social, right? So what we, generally what you mean by social, and what we're going to sort of use as a working definition today, is the notion of an interaction, right? Which you could call information transfer, right? It means that some, the anim, one animal's sensor, either sensory cues is putting into the environment or other aspects of it are going to cause a change in behavior, and the other one based off of some information that's been translated. How you're actually going to define all those words I said in that last sentence is tricky. And that's really where we're going to go. Right. Any, th any others? Any other thoughts? Right. So, this is, this, so this is sort of where, where a lot of things are. Right. But in order to maybe get a little bit more insight as to what our problem is, let's, let's move up and let's, let's relax this constraint a little bit and sort of remind ourselves a little bit of the things that Lisa was talking about last week, about, about what happens you have collective behavior. Right, so Lisa was talking about it in the context of active matter, but let's talk about it again in the context of these guys. Oops. Right, so some sort of a collective, so now we're in the large end limit. Right? And so this is something where people have been doing a lot of work over a lot of years, thinking about how how, how, do, how does long-range order emerge in these types of systems? Okay. And so this, the standard sort of prototypical way that this is thought of is through the V-Shack model, right? Which, which, is, and which I know you guys have seen before, but let's just remind ourselves for a second, right? Is that what you can see is that you have a bunch of quote-unquote voids in the environment, as, as they're often called, and, and you have some sort of a, a, a relationship where you're going to move forward and you're going to uh, interact, so you're going to take some measurement around you, whether it's number of nearest neighbors or within some interaction radius, you basically get the same thing. And then you're going to say, I'm going to align to them with some accuracy and with some degree of noise. And so then you can get some plots, like for example, if you look at the, if you, and then you basically can measure sort of, let's say chi equals the average equals something like this, right? Where where chi, chi is the sort of your your mean orientation of the or po mean polarization. Right? So if you're going to measure that mean polarization, right, you can measure chi as a function of, say, density. If you measure it as a function of density, you get something that's going to look like this, right, where eventually you get to 1 at long length at, as the density of these things get larger. Or you can do it in terms of the noise of how well you're following your neighbors. And you measure chi. And then you get something which are more looks a little bit more like that. 
And you can do all sorts of fun things like collective scaling and other people like John Toner and Yuhai too have done some fun stuff looking at uh, actually doing renormalization group on this sort of system using hydrodynamic equation. It's fun things. Um, that was actually one, uh, if I decided to be more mathy, that was one option for the lecture today, but I decided let's be a little crazier, all right? <laughs> which, is, which is generally my ML. Um, so, but, so but, this, but this is a problem. This is sort of something where we've learned a lot, right? And so now obviously you might say this is a dumb model. Can this actually say anything about any real system? And I mean, there are very few systems where it says something. But here's one nice example, and this is, this is a paper by Bill et al. and from Ian Cousins' group uh, back in 2006. And what you basically do is you put a bunch of locusts around an annulus, and you write a V-shake model to, with this, with you have, but you have to add one extra term, and that one extra term is you assume that there is some inertia. Right? So you, you assume that there's the noise, you're going to convolve your noise with some amount of motion of what you are making last time. And if you add that term, you can measure this quantity up here, which is, sim which is, which is simply the, so these locusts are going around an annulus like this. So here's the x-axis. Let's say you have a locus here. We're going to find this angle is theta. And we're going to define the angle that the locust is moving with respect to this angle, with respect to the horizontal is alpha. And then you basically say, what's, the, what's this angle between those two things? And you do this arc sine of sine to put it between, minus, uh, between 0 and pi. So between minus pi over 2 and, uh, and pi over 2. And what you wind up seeing is that, uh, and you can define your order parameter in a very similar way, except now between 0 and 1, your order parameter is between minus 1 and 1. And if you look at the experiment, so this is experimental data, you put them in at different densities. And you can see in some cases you get large fluctuations. Other cases you go, everybody's moving around the circle counterclockwise, then, then at some point it switches, everyone goes the other direction, and so on. And if you compare this, you, and, so, and just like in the Vishek model, I think here there's only one extra parameter. So there's three parameters here. So you fit those three parameters to a model. And you can actually reproduce, with the Vishek model, you can reproduce this data quite well. But that's, that's nice, right? It's a relatively simple setup, and it's far from naturalistic. But at least you have a bunch of animals moving around in a cylinder, and you can predict what they're doing. That's pretty good. So you can see, predict, say, what's the mean alignment as a function of time? And then as you move, say, the, num as you move the density along this axis, you see that the mean alignment is 0. And then you get this. Either it goes to 1 and minus 1. Or you get, uh, say, for example, in the, no the total amount of time spent in one of the ordered phases that it increases with density and other things like this. By the way, anybody happen to know why the locusts actually swarm like this? Why they're paying attention? Yeah. Yes, they are cannibalistic. <laughs> so I do because it's because it's just par partially because uh, seeing Ian talk about this is just a joy. Because <laughs> they cause they had no idea, no one knew about this beforehand, right? People just because people would always think about locusts as uh, as herbivores that would go and destroy fields and cause all sorts of biblical problems, right? But but in reality, you can see, once they get into this Gregorius phase, they often actually they have high protein needs, and turns out this is a very good way of meeting that protein need. <laughs> Animals are very strange. <laughs> but as a result, you can actually do this. And by the way, I think it's still on Ian's website. You, they, they wrote a video game where you can play the cannibalistic locust game. That's, good. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it too early to ask? Do we know this? Who they eat in that cloud? Are they more likely to eat their relatives than not? Or I have no idea. It's a great question. I, that, that's a that's a question for a different lecture. <laughs> I, I, I'm curious. I don't know. My my guess is they're not. I mean, these are animals. You put them in a an annulus and they start running around, and they'll do this for hours on end. 
my hunch is, and these ones are probably all somewhat related locusts. So my hunch is they just start eating whoever's in front of them. There's, these are not you social creatures. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, Hockman. Do you want me to break up the Feynman diagrams? I'm sure this is probably possible, but I, 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 have not, I haven't seen it. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Cannibalistic locusts aside, the quite I think I mean, the reason I sort of going going talking about this because this isn't really what I want to talk about so much today, but I'm talking about this to try and figure out what about this allowed for a successful prediction to be made. This is a pretty dumb model, right? There's no real reason that you would expect this thing to work. They had to add one small term to it in order to actually wind up having the data fit. But in the end of the day, it's a pretty dumb model, and its behavior is pretty non-generic in that there's not too, I mean, there's, there's a wide set of things this model can't do, and it fits the data rather well. And sort of what allowed this to work? And I think what allowed it to work is the fact you had variables like this. This is a system where you had variables where you have something which is, you have a control parameter, and then you have some order parameter, and you can sort of do this thing. And once, once you're sort of in that regime of things, any self-respecting statistical physicist can go and try and do whatever calculations they're comfortable doing, and you can try and make some logic and some sense out of it. But if we go back to this interaction of courting fruit flies, what are the order parameters here? Right, there's, what are the order parameters? What are the, what are the control parameters even? Right? I mean, you can, there are things you can certainly control. Right? You, can, you can control aspects of the genetic architecture. You can control the temperature. You can, but it's unclear what, even if you were to pick a variable, whether it would relate to any specific outcome that you would want to measure. And that, to me, is the real challenge. And what I'm going to talk about today is trying to think about sort of I mean, maybe this picture is just doesn't even make sense here. And that, I think, is probably the case, right? The idea that the statistical physics picture of having some sort of like an order parameter and a control parameter to describe what's happening with these interactions, maybe we need to move towards a different approach, a different idea, when we're looking at these systems where we can't do any sort of large number averaging to help us out. Right. So let's... Let's focus on maybe one sort of more mundane question. And this is, this is sort of, let's, before we sort of go to all these other sort of crazy ideas, let's think about the idea of space. Right? And the fact, as I said before, these are all interactions which are happening in space. Right? So there's some underlying probability density, maybe P of Let's say, we, let's say we only have two animals, right? So we have x1 is the position of animal two, animal one, x2 is the position of animal two, and then we have some, let's, we have some feature vector describing the behaviors of those two animals, right? And probably also, we would also want to include time in an ideal world, right? Because as we said, these social interactions can come and they can go, and so, having a notion of statistical stationarity might not be the best one here. Right? So just averaging over time might lead to a lot of weird conclusions. So other than the fact you have a lot of variables and it's high dimensional, right? think about why, why might this be hard? Right? So oops. I'll go to that in a second. Right. Right. So the picture I like to draw is this. Right? So you imagine what a lot of the things that we've talked about so far have been involving, you have some, a distance metric between two points in time. Right. So if we remember b back a whole two lectures ago from me, uh, we had these, uh, these wavelet transforms. Right. So we had like mode one, the frequency and time, and there was some notion of what was going on. And then we would take, say, one point in time, try and relate that. So say this is T2, 
and that's T1. What we'd want to do is have some sort of a mapping where we have, we have some mapping from this is some lower dimensional Y of T1, and this would be some lower dimensional Y of T2. In order to do this, this required, and almost any way you would do this, is going to require some distance metric between what do we mean is different between what time t1 and what time t, what's happening at time t1 and what's happening at time t2. Right, so we could measure this in the distance between those wavelet transform amplitudes. And that's what we did for the case of one animal. But now in the case of two animals, we have this other problem, which we have to make a value judgment here. And this is one where it's, there aren't as many easy solutions. Right, so the value judgment we have to make is this one. Think about it, this is a triangle inequality problem almost. Right. So I have two animals, one, at one time point, two flies here, they, have, they are, this fly is sort of rubbing its front legs together and they're 20 centimeters apart. Right. So this is what's happening at some point in time. Now we have two different points in time. Right. So this is say, a distance between this and time one and a distance between time two. Right. So here, the flies are doing the same behavior, so they're still rubbing their front legs together. But they're now they're 18 centimeters apart instead of 20 centimeters apart. Down here, they're exactly 20 centimeters apart, but now this one is doing a wing flick. Which one of these two are more similar to this? Right. This requires actually making some sort of a statement, right? You could normalize by a variance, or, but that's sort of hiding what you're actually thinking underneath the rug. And this is not, a, I mean, it seems like it's a sort of a trivial, sort of boring thing. But at the end of the day, what you're trying to say when you're trying to quantify and trying to decide what are the aspects of social behavior, particularly in this sort of stereotype behavior framework we've been talking about, is it's not clear what you would want to pick. Okay? And let's say instead of maybe you say, oh, this is such a different behavior you wouldn't want. This, this is obviously much further away. What if this was grooming its antenna instead of doing this instead of grooming its front two legs. Right? It's not obvious which you would pick. Right. So I mean, the standard way, I mean, no. There's always going to be some degree of difficulty with this. But I mean, by taking this prob probability density, you could, let, let's say we're going to just look at the behavior of one of the animals. Let's just say behavior one. Of the, one, of the, one of my animals is just standing still, and I'm just looking to see what the behavior of that one animal is in, in, in um, respect to what the other animal's doing. So we can obviously, how people tend to do this is you can factor this into a couple of different things. Right? You can say this is the probability of Where, where am I, given that I'm doing a behavior? So if I'm grooming my head, where am I with respect to the other animal? Times. Or you could factor it the other way, saying, given I'm in a particular location, what behavior am I likely to be doing? Yeah, Michael. Right. Is that another Let's just include that in our X for now. X is, X, is a, uh, X is a dimension describing the whole orientation. So that could be position X, Y, Z, theta, phi, beta, whatever, whatever angles and numbers you want. Right. Not, necess not necessarily a real space number. And, right, and yeah, I mean, these are obviously things that are very important. It matters that, uh, that the male fly is oriented towards the female not just because she can see him, but also because the, when he's making his little song, so he, the male fly will go and do this and make a little song that the female can hear, but that's a very directional song. So it creates, the, it creates vortices which move in one particular direction, and so that orientation does matter. So, but let's just pretend those are included in X1 and X2 for now. Sure, fine, yes. Right. But I was, I was putting that in there also to include the, um, 
like the also the angles and other things that Michael was talking about. And so here's just one example. So this is some work by, uh, we did with a collaborator, Ugne Kobate. And what you can do, so this is looking at fruit fly behavior. So here are the red fly is the, is the male fly, and the blue fly is the female fly. And what you can do is you can say, let's, let's look at quadrants. So here is exactly what you're saying. Let's look to, well, not exactly, but let's just say, given the fly is in one of these four quadrants. So here is with the female fly is this female-centric coordinate system up here. You can ask, what are the behaviors that the male is doing in each of those four things? And you can see, sort of, oh, there's differences. Right? Or you could do it go the other way. So this is in this regime of looking at P behavior, given x1 and x2. Comparably, you can go the other way and say, given I'm doing that behavior, so given I'm doing uh, wing, mo given we have wing grooming on the bottom, where am I in the female or the male-centric frame? And so sometimes, like this one, you get a nice clear answer. Like, OK, if you're doing this behavior, you're almost always doing this like, right in front of the, f uh, the, the female is always doing this right in front of the male, with, uh, which basically means she's sort of usually staring at him like, what? I'm here. I'm here just grooming my wings. I, I'm not paying attention. Um, but this is a very common thing you see. Right? But this isn't like, this isn't in some ways, I mean, for a lot of reasons, this isn't particularly um, comforting, right? You can do this. I mean, again, you have to do something. Right? You don't want to just sit in the f sit in the sideline and not try and do anything, but you don't really feel like you're learning a huge amount because you're first of all you're ignoring like I erased a bunch of things up here, right? But you're ignoring time, right? So there's, this is completely statistically stationary, right? You're you're doing this normalization over the full data set, and so you're ignoring time in your understanding, right? It's lots of numbers, too, right? <laughs> you, I mean, you saw these plots. Right? These, there's a bunch of numbers in here. It's unclear how to interpret or what the key aspects you're going to take away is. You can always make up bedtime stories looking at this. Oh, the male is always here. You, you can say this. You can look at it. You can stare for a while and say, aha. But that's never guaranteed. And it's not, it feels more like a fishing expedition than actually trying to do some real theoretical investigation. You're just sort of sitting there hoping that you're going to come up with something. Yeah, Ahmed. What? Uh, fishing expeditions can be great, but generally you don't. Generally, you want to come home and be able to like, eat them, or something more or less. I guess if you're fly fishing or something, maybe not. But analogies only go so far. <laughs> but the uh, well, that, more about that later. But the the idea is. That's not to say necessarily you don't always want to do these type of correlative studies. And that's really what this is, right? This is saying you're trying to correlate one thing with another and trying to sort of hope that there's some logical and sensible pattern there. And there's, there's value to that, but we want to be able to actually do theory, right? This isn't theory. This is, this is just finding correlations in data, right? Trying to and actually understand sort of what's going on and what are the things we actually want to measure. I don't want to derail you, but I will. <laughs> Well, ideally, the theory should explain the correlations in the data. In terms of <laughs> what do you mean? A correlation is a summary of uh, the theory seems to me that sum summary of correlations in the data. Right? Well, a correlation a correlation is your is your measurement variable, right? This is in some ways like this is in some ways a correlation. It's not a correlation function, but it's it's an order parameter, right? And so this is the thing you want to predict, right? I don't know if this is the thing, in this case, you want, you want to be able to predict. Right? This would be a very difficult concept to predict. Right? Maybe I stated that a little bit inelegantly, but that, that's more what I'm, what I'm referring to here. Right? That sort of answer, more or less, kind of. <laughs> so this is all correlative. So the other thing that you might want to do is just sort of own it. Right? You know what? Let's just, let's just write down and try and ha just do a regression. Right? So instead of just doing these population conditional averaging, let's actually try and do a regression and see what does one animal do that the other animal might be doing. And how, how might we think about that is we can do a regression in two sort of different ways. Right? And, th and this is type of like the, cl if you go to any paper in the literature, that tries to measure social behavior, uh, particularly in a, in a lot of like the 
um, behavioral genetics and behavior neuroscience paper, what you see is a lot of these things. For so example, you see something like a courtship index, which is you make some definition where a human observer notes like, how often that court, a courtship activity is occurring. Right? And you, have, you write down some annotated version of what a courtship behavior is, and then you count, OK, what's the fraction of time? Multiply it by 100 that the fly is spending courting. And so you can do different sorts of things and measure that. The other one, and what we'll be talking mainly about, is thinking about a focal behavior. Right? So you say, looking at aggressive, an aggressive behavior between fruit flies, they're going to talk about, say, a lunge. So when one fly lunges at the other one, let's, say, let's try and understand what are the things that immediately proceed when a fruit fly, when a fruit fly lunges at the other one. Right? So you have focal events, and then you have these indices, which I'm sort of going to refer to as sort of a, a coarse attempt at doing a hidden state. Right? The idea is courtship is something which is a higher descriptive level than the precise measurements that you're making. And so you're going to try and sort of make some inference about that. What we'll focus on right now is this idea of a focal behavior. What are the, sort of the things in our experiment that can predict whether we're going to see a behavior like this, like a lunge, occur? And so typically, what you see for that, I mean, it's, just, it's a regression. So you pick a, f a focal event, and then you calculate something like, what's the probability of the event that you care about, given some y. And this y could, have, could be something about the environment, so some piece of sensory information that's, just, uh, that's about just the environment in the world. It could be. I mean, it's sort of in the environment, but it could be something about what the other animal is doing. And related to both, you could have some notion of history. So you could put in time traces of what's going on. Right? And so you're going to try and predict what's the probability of event, given a bunch of environmental variables. And generally, the form that most people like using is something along this point, like say g is some weight matrix times our vector of stuff y plus maybe some offset. Right? And often g, because you want this to be a probability, is going to be something which looks either sort of logistic-y or, or other, other sort of function. Right? Now, you can play various sorts of games with this, and there's varieties called like generalized linear models, of which this is, of which is sort of a, a subclass of this. But this is a very common sort of thing. And so I'm going to show just one example here. All right, so here's an example from Mala Murthy's lab, some work by Pip Cohen. Seeing about, like, you have two fruit flies. I just know flies more than other things. Um, where what you're going to do is you're going to measure a bunch of stuff. Right? You're going to measure it's the fly's forward velocity, its angular, its angular uh, velocity, things about whether it's moving sideways, uh, and, what's, and the relative distance between them. And you take. But basically, you do this pipeline up here, right? So you, you take a stimulus history of what's going on. You convolve that with some linear filter, and which you need to fit. And then you put that through a logistic to make, to make it go between 0 and 1. And you can basically try and optimize how well you can do a predicted versus actual performance. The details of this regression are super important. There's a gazillion ways you can do this. But the point is, like, you go to the literature, you see a bunch of things like this. These sort of generalized linear models or other types of linear-ish models where you're trying to correlate variables in the past to what's going on in the future. And so for example, what they see, so this is the male forward velocity here. This is where the fly starts singing a particular type of, I should always say singing, because by singing I mean doing this. But when the fly starts doing what's called sign song, which is just what it sounds like, it's the sinusoidal oscillation of the wing compared to a different type of song, which is pulse song, where it goes <laughs> Like that. It, does, it doesn't exactly go like that. It sounds like a helicopter in the, if you actually listen to it. But, the, but, the, but you basically say it's trying to say what's happening right before it does this start the sinusoidal oscillation. And you can say, ah, the male, so this is time relative to start of the bout in milliseconds. And so like in the last like tenth of a second right before the bout starts, you see that the male speeds up. Over here, you see that right before the bout starts, 
the male tends to catch up towards the female. So, so basically, the male is running towards the female right before they start doing the sign song. Or before they move between these two, these two types of transitions, so the phi will usually start about doing a sign song that will move to this pulse song, and you could do the same sort of regression. Right. And I mean, this is useful. It can give you some information about what the variables are. But again, it's sort of owning the fact that we're just going to do something correlative. And also, we're, we still have the same problems that we saw over there. This is still statistically stationary. Right? We're assuming that there's always, like, if this event is going to happen, these are always going to be the things which lead up to it. Um, and still, it's, I mean, you can do some stuff to make this easier to interpret, but notice how they pulled out out of all of those variables on the left. In each case, they just pulled out a few of them. Okay. You can look at the other ones with all sorts of a lot uh, less interpretable numbers. This is, this is how you get a page, paper into nature. Anyway, no, um, no it's, I, I joke, this is, this is, I mean, but this is a great example of actually how you can do these sort of things to get a very nice set of results talking about how you can relate the behavior one thing to another, but it's still about how do you pull up these high dimensional correlations in data, and as a theorist, I still don't know really what to do with that. Right? That's in this particular case. And not only that, it also requires you, and this is the more subtle thing, it requires you to have had that focal event that you care about. Right? They had to have the insight to say, ah, I'm going to care about the start of sign song over here. And the probably this is a very reasonable choice, but in other cases it's not going to be as obvious. Right? Maybe the thing which actually mattered for the female's decision about whether uh, about whether to accept the male's advances here is in some very very subtle aspect that is a human eye because we're not flies we wouldn't have caught. And so trying you, this requires you to have something where you can put into a binary into a binary probability at some point. And that's not necessarily always a luxury that we have. <laughs> and so you can do so. And just also to say, you can do a very similar thing instead of in time. You can also do this in space. So this is, again, work for me and Cousins Group, um, where, and there's all sorts of other variants of this which have come since then, um, including equivalent types of things with using attention based neural networks and cool stuff from Gonzalo de Pulha Vieja's lab. But, um, you can basically say, what's the interaction? You can put a fish in the middle, and you can say, given that there's a fish around me at some point, what's that going to make me like? How is that going to make me likely to speed up? What's, how is that going to make me likely to turn to the left or turn to the right? And you can then do this very similar type of regression and see, OK, how is, how is the fish making a linear model to try and make these decisions about how it's going to move within a shoal? Okay. And again, there's a whole variety of these things. And this, and this is useful, and what's sort of fun about this in particular is then obviously this becomes something that you can put into a model where you can simulate it forward and then see if you get similar behavior to what you actually see in data. So, so th these are things which actually can be quite useful, but again, this is definitely more of a case uh, of like the large end limit as well. So, so all this stuff aside, really sort of try and think about the dynamics and the structure of what's going on. I think underlying a lot of this is this notion of what is an interaction? And how can we measure it? So let's, let's go back to this case that we have our two flies running around in the dish. Right? What are some ways we can measure whether at a given point in time that they're interacting? Yeah. Yeah, you can measure, some, you can measure something about um, sort of like... Um, No, we'll say non-random movement patterns. Right, so th think about like, how you could think about this. Is imagine I had a fly and a ghost fly. Right? So I took a fly from one fly alone in a dish, had it roam around, and then I had another fly 
alone in its own dish, and then I just pretended like they were in the same dish together. I could measure what would be the distance correlations and structure from that, and then you could try and say, ah, okay, that's something that was weird that was happening at this point. All right, so that's one, one thing you could do. Yeah, other thoughts? So right, but how do you? But that, that's exactly what I'm trying to ask. How do you how do you figure out whether it's something's been affected? Okay, that's another good one, right? You could say something like, synchronization, right? Do you see that animals are doing things at the same time? Other thoughts. <laughs> Transfer entry. <laughs> okay, fine. You could you try and make some. Well, I'm going to I'm I'm going to I'm going to translate that to a less technical term, and I'm going to say predictability. Right. So if you tell me what one animal is doing, do I have more information about what the other animal is doing than I would have naively just drawing from from a hat? Right, and there's a lot of ways you can measure that. Transfer entropy is one. Yeah. But this could also be that you have two flies being carried by the same mm -hmm. wind, right? Yep. So how do you distinguish them just being hypothetical versus actually interacting? That's a great question. I don't know. Well, well, I'll try and suggest some things, but I mean, that's, right. this is why like, none of these things, my, my point is that like, all of these things are a little unsatisfying. <laughs> yeah, Hawkman. Well, this was like the spatial structure, right? Because we, ha we had to define a distance metric, right? That distance metric is non-trivial, and we had to make that decision. How do you do that? It might have, but then if you sort of think about it, it's going to be much less stereotyped, right? If I'm doing this behavior at 20 centimeters apart compared to 18 centimeters apart, right, it's probably going to be pretty continuous between like 18 and 15 or 15 and 20 or something like that. So you're going to be smoothing out your distribution of these distances. So think this whole notion of being have a collection of stereotype behaviors might not actually apply as well. In fact, you can actually do that, and it's true. So you wind up being in this much higher dimensional set of structures. No, you're, the concept that we've been using about stereotype, stereotypy as a general principle don't, doesn't work in the same mathematical way. It's qualitatively different. So OK, so we have non-random movement patterns, synchronization, predictability. I'm also going to say, oh yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, this probably is sort of covered by all three of those, but I would look for reactions of one to the other. So for example, with the courting male, you could always see that it was strictly following whatever the, the female did. Right, yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would note that as sort of like a predictability. Right. Any other thoughts? One more, yeah. Right, let, let, let's, pr let's pretend we're not allowed to perturb the system. Right, we're, we're, we're just measuring. I was just saying, so you can actually have a comparison between what you normally see versus. Right. Let's, pretend we're out, let's pretend we're out in the wild and we're just watching two animals doing whatever they're doing in a particular case. Right? We're, we're just trying to actually measure whether there's an interaction that occurs. We can, you can try and mess around and do some fancy genetic and neural things, and maybe that'll get you there, but maybe not. The other thing I'd like to add is a notice of and I should again put this in quotation marks, because I mean this literally, not in the figurative sense, or not, sorry, not in, the, not in the physics sense, but I mean actually new behaviors emerge, right? Not just you have different movement statistics, but also maybe like if you put, to, if you put a male fly in just in a dish by itself, you're unlikely to see it 
put its, put its wing out and do this unless you do something very nasty to it. So there's certain behaviors which might be a signifier that there's a social interaction occurring. That if, and so you, may, you could imagine you could build up a probability distribution of behaviors. If for an individual is sitting alone by a dish, you could then say, all right, now what are the probability distributions of that individual's behaviors with another animal, and are there any new things that come up? That, that tells me, oh, there's a social interaction happening there. So that's sort of a sufficient but not necessary aspect for a social interaction, right? Because not all social interactions will be these emerging behaviors, but if it's emerging, it's a pretty good chance that it is a social behavior. Yeah? So that one what? So your, your point there is what is an interaction. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what you would say. Maybe that like some interaction has occurred, but it doesn't really tell you anything at all, does it? Because you have one new behavior. So you could say that like an interaction has occurred, but not what it is. Exactly. Right, no. This is right. And what is an interaction? I didn't say what that interaction is, exactly. And so it tells you that there's something, like, let's start simple. Let's just say that they're, they're communicating information, there's something going on that there's an interaction. Yeah? So if there's a new behavior, how can you tell that it's due to another animal versus just a new environmental behavior? That, that's, I mean, or, or, I mean, or even worse. Right? Or it could just be due to some weird internal state of the animal. Right? So ideally, let's imagine we can sample this for a really long time. So we've sampled our distributions over a very, very long time with the animal by itself and the animal with another animal. So hopefully we've marginalized over all of the environmental stuff is the hope. Yeah? I hope I'm not being circular in this, but I'm, I feel like... Oh, I'm being circular, so it's fine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so that, that could be, I mean, I don't, that would be a way of characterizing it, right? I don't know if that would be our definition, right? So that would be something, if we can see that, like, I think from the standpoint of behavior, what we would want to see is that information is used in some way, right? So that certainly is an important aspect, and that's kind of what they were getting at when we were looking at the paper from Mala Murthy's group, is trying to get what are the sensory information of the other animal that are being used to make decisions. But I think what... At least what I'm focusing more on today are those decisions themselves. Right. Great. And s oh, well, more. All right. It shouldn't, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be, right? You could have an animal come in standing still, and maybe its decision is to stand still more longer. Mm-hmm. Right. So, right. And so that there's, there's, there's another aspect on top of this about directionality. Like, again, that's also fantastic sets of questions and things that we can't even do this. Right? Let, let, let's start here. <laughs> right? <laughs> and the idea, and, and once we can do this, there's a good chance that doing that, like if we can convince ourselves doing something on this line is reasonable, then that's a good thing. So. Because it's in the morning, let's, let's, let's think about this in a more sort of visceral context. So what we're going to see here is the Marcus Roberts oh, sound, jazz uh, trio perform something. Right? So we have here we have, a, we have a bassist, we have a pianist, we have a drummer. Right? There's some sort of, an, they're obviously interacting. Right? If you were to take each one of them performing individually and sort of cut them off from the other two, right? and then played them back together, it would sound awful. Well, maybe it'd sound like something out of free jazz or something, but it would, it would be weird, right? And so definitely there's an effect. Yet, they're not, if you were just to look at the video, how would you tell they're interacting? They're not looking at each other. In fact, he's blind. So this really wouldn't work, right? So if you were to listen to the individual, there's some sheet music that they all know. There's some, like, maybe there's some evolutionary program and sort of you'd go to the evolution, if, think about it from the animal perspective, right? But if you, if you think about this, right, it's, there's this complicated set of things going on, 
But if you were to look at the interaction, you wouldn't see it. If you were to listen to the interaction, each one of the parts by themselves, so if you were to separate out the bass, the drum, and the, and the piano, each one of the parts sound pretty reasonable in and of themselves. Now, you could measure something like, say, synchronization, because that would probably give you a pretty good hint. But the point is, is that the th that's because we know something about the underlying structure of what they're trying to do. Right? Yeah, Ilya. Yes, I mean, so you certainly see this. There's, there's one clear social interaction where, where you see precisely this. It's not a very happy social interaction for one of the animals. And that is pursuit capture. Right? So you see certain types of animals. You'll see, let's say there's a prey that's sort of running like this. You can, and then there's some animal that wants to eat it that's starting, that's starting here, some distance away. You can show that uh, in a lot of cases, like in the case of, say, tiger beetles, they pick the optimal pursuit angle because they're anticipating that this guy is going to keep going forward and some animals are dumb enough to not shift their trajectory. So if you're dumb enough not to shift your trajectory, this animal will go and pick an uh, optimal trajectory to match it. In fact, dragonflies do this to eat fruit flies. There's some very nice work from Anthony Leonardo's group showing this. So there is example of that. Oh, oh, you're thinking about the, uh, the, 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 ga the, uh, the mirror game stuff. The, uh, yeah, with reading and re recording activities. Oh, oh, so, oh, right. Sorry, I was, th I was thinking, there's a whole set of, I, I heard you wrong, I was thinking Uriolan yeah. stuff. Because yeah. Uriolan has this stuff for thinking about actually about the mirror game and how like, like this, this famous thing where actors will go and try and like match each other in front of a mirror and do this. <laughs> and try, trying to anticipate what the other person is doing. Um, but then there's other work from, again, I'm here talking about Greg's work, <laughs> of think, thinking about like looking at actually trying to correlate brain signals during uh, a comprehension, read, a reading comprehension task, essentially. But so this is all interesting things. I think for everything we've talked about here, there's a definite goal, though, right? You're trying to understanding what does it mean to match something, right? And this assumes that everybody's trying to do the same thing, right? We looked at that jazz trio. All three of them are doing very different things. Yeah. Right, so, the, the, well, to a certain extent, that's the idea of having, like, you've sat down and you've decided to form this interaction, right? But there are certain, if I would have let the video play longer, they do get to improvisory sections where they don't know what the actual thing is doing and they're paying attention. And if you actually were to sort of put a metronome to the music, you would see that it's speeding up and slowing down and speeding up and slowing down at different points. And so there is interaction more than just the whole overall game that they're playing, right? And so, like in my weird analogy, again, analogies are always terrible at some level, is it's sort of like the fact that they're all sitting down together is more they're all the same species, right? They're playing this game, there's the rules of the interaction, they know what the sheet music is. Now, given that sheet music, how do you actually, if you put a different bassist in there, it might sound different, even though they all, right? And so that's, that's sort of more what I'm thinking about. But yeah, I mean, that, that's always a great point, is that they decided to play the game in the first place, which is also an interesting question, but not what I'm talking about today. <laughs> Um, let's see if I, right. And this sort of the other point, which is sort of a little bit more comforting, is that you can note that they're playing together through this collective variable, right? If you were to just measure, say, the, the waveforms of the music as it played, you would notice that they tend to all fall on the same spot. And so you could use that as a collective variable to describe maybe there's something that's non-random at least happening here. But that's the t I wanted to sort of show that as kind of a visceral example of, or of the, the sort of the problem we're in. Even in something where we know what the answer is, it's not always the most obvious thing about how to measure it. And plus, again, it's early in the morning, and a little bit of relaxing music is, can't hurt too much. Okay. So, right. 
And so this is, this, is sort of, this is what I had prepared. And so this is, again, some nice slides made by the inimitable uh, Ugna Klebate. And what you basically see is sort of an, uh, a pictorial representation of these sort of things that we've been talking about. Right? So let's take this example of two flies and try and say, OK, did we see an interaction? Right? So this is just the fly, male fly by itself, is doing these three behaviors in all equal frequency. And it has a particular time course in which it does those three things. You could then say, oh, OK, now let's add, the male, let's add the female fly in. And oh, there's an interaction because it's synchronized. Right. So because of that, because of that synchronization, we can then say that maybe, maybe there's some interaction that occurred. Or you could say, well, they're not synchronizing, but they have really similar repertoires. Like, like they're not doing the same behaviors at the same time, but the fact that they're doing this behaviors in the same relative proportion maybe is some signature of similarity. Or lastly, at least of these, you could say you could talk about emerging behaviors. Right now we have behavior four, which we wouldn't have seen in the other case, and now it should start showing up. Right, this is sort of the pictorial idea of what we have here. And then the other notion, which wasn't in the picture, but I think is, sort of, these, these are the four I have. I think that, uh, I, also, I also think that this idea, which I hadn't uh, anticipated putting in here, but this idea of anticipation, which is related to predictability, might also be a, a good notion to think about here as well. Right. Right, so thinking about, like, how do you actually do this? And all of, looking at this, these are all things, with the exception of, well, ev with all of these, essentially, with the exception of predictability, are related to the notion of um, they're, they're statistically stationary. Right? It assumes you have some stationarity. Like if you're measuring a repertoire, you're measuring over some period of time. If you're measuring over like whether a new behavior comes up, you're actually saying, OK, now I'm in this new situation. Let's average over this thing and see whether it's stationary. And the, uh, the notion of interaction, I think, has to be one that's intrinsically dynamic and one that can change in time. And, this is a, and so that, to me at least, makes the notion of thinking about predictability as a way of trying to at least go forward. It's not perfect, as we've noticed. There's a lot of problems with thinking about that, because you do get this notion of uh, rising tide lifts all boats. But maybe we can try and say something. And if we're careful enough with our statistics and everything, maybe we can point out, can we find epics in the data where it's more predictable than others? So what we're going to try and think about, this is the dynamical property. Right? So this, so this and, and I see a bunch of Greg's lab members smiling and smirking in the back. Uh, let's let's, let's no sh think about this idea of predictability from a standpoint of a dynamical a aspect. And I'm going to take these sets of questions and put them and make, try and make it a little bit more specific and say, at what times can I predict one animal's behavior from the other. And for the standpoint of today, we're as sort of uh, and related to Liam's question, is we're going to treat this as symmetric. So we're going to say, I don't care which, indivi which individual is predicting whom. Let's just say there's some overall predictability where if I were to add up how much information I have of predicting one versus predicting two, or predicting from two predicting one, I want to know that that's more than I would naively expect. Right. So how can we do this? And sort of the math we're going to rely here, and so I, I put this up because I'm, I'm terrible at drawing things, is we're going to think about Tokens embedding theorem. And I am not going to do this the full degree of justice that it deserves. 
but I wanted to sort of get to give the brief outline over why this might be an interesting idea. And the idea is we have some dynamical system, dx dt equals f of x, right? And we're going to assume this is nice and well behaved. It's continuous. It does all sorts of nice things. It's differentiable. We're not. We're not going to. We're going to assume that for some. For some reason, we're going to assume animals are nicely behaved, which maybe isn't the greatest assumption, but let's just run with it. All right. So we have some dynamical system like this. And the idea is we're going to create what's called a delay embedding. So we take one of these variables in here, xi, and we're going to create a map. And with this map is going to be xi of t, xi of t plus tau, xi t plus 2 tau, all the way up to the end of our data set. Right, so we're basically taking a bunch of points and separating them out by some time tau and creating, I'm sorry, not to the end of our data set, but we'll do this to some embedding dimension rd. Right, so how you pick what d and tau is is a matter of, uh, is a matter of some amounts of fuzziness, but let's just pretend we can do this well. Okay. Again, most of my lectures are about ignoring the technical aspects and thinking about conceptual, so let's just pretend that we've pick, we have a good way of picking tau and d. Right. And what the idea is, and so this is going to create what we call a shadow manifold M xi. So what this means is so we have a bunch of data points. As we move through the data set, this is going to create a bunch of points in a high dimensional set. So here's like what we would see for a Lorentz attractor. So here's our standard three dimensional Lorentz attractor. And say what you would do is create an embedding from just one of those variables in this, and you get this. And sort of the beauty of Takens is saying that if you have a nice dynamical system and your noise is low and other nice things like that, is there's a one to one mapping between this and this on a certain condition, right? So that there has to be sort of, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between this shadow manifold based on uh, this and another shadow manifold, say, mxj, right? So that that mapping exists only, only if there's a, a direct dependence on one, from one to the other. Right. So essentially what you have is this is only, you're only going to be able to do this is if this has some term related to xj and some other things. Right. So you're only going to be able to make this prediction based off of if you have a direct relationship. Right. So for example, if I had a dynamical system that looked like, I don't know, x1 equals f of x1, x3, x2 equals g of x2, x3 equals h of x1, x2, x3. I would be able to predict x3 from both x1 and x2. I could predict x1 from x3, but I couldn't predict x2 from any of the other variables. right? So you would hear say, and so this gives you some notion of causality. Right? And this is an analysis, so it's Takin's original theorem, but there is a whole set of analysis that drew out of Sugihara's paper, and I think this from 2011, is that right? 2011, 2012, something like that? Like like yeah, it's in science. So convergent cross mapping is what this whole approach is called, and there's a bunch of weirdness about how you actually get it to work. But let's, again, let's pretend that we can do this well. We were, we're, we're in a happy mood this morning. Right? We're going to pretend this actually is going to work. Okay. So generally, I mean, to gloss over a bunch of things, a good way of picking tau is just looking at the autocorrelation time of your, of your data set. Right? You, don't want tau to be, you don't want tau to be huge. If tau is huge, then you're not, you've gone further than the dynamical structure in a dynamical system. If tau is too small, you're not actually going to be capturing it, and so you don't have this mapping. So you generally want to pick tau around the, like, I think the, f the form of the theorem says there exists a tau in D in which this occurs. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. 
they have some constraints in their latest yeah. research, which tells how big it should be. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's, it's a complicated mess, long, ter long story short. question which I always have about this stuff is that all of these fields are for systems that are at an attractor, right, or close to an attractor. And are the systems that we care about actually close to an attractor rather than moving around in some random trajectories in space and never actually settling down? Well, the, I mean, so we don't know. Right? To a certain extent, what we have to do is try and make measurements that, are, that can make predictions. And what I would say is how I'm going to treat this, and so what I haven't talked about is we're going to treat this in a way, so we're going to not do this in a statistically stationary way. We're going to look at, take chunks of time, do this analysis, and see basically whether this predictability is changing with time. So I agree. It could just be that you've never settled down to anything on an attractor, at which point Takens isn't the world's best thing. But let's just try. <laughs> I, I, I agree that is a concern, though. Again, this is, this is, this all, everything we're talking about here is more sort of my crazy, weird, fever dreams of maybe things about that we can do. And so given that, how do we actually practically compute anything? So we need to actually, so we said predicting. I didn't actually have a definition of predicting. So in practice, what you do is you say, let's say, one, I'm gonna, you're going to make some m xi from some data set. That's easy enough. And we're going to say, we're going to take this from some over some range, so not over the whole data set. We're going, to create, we're going to create this over some range of our data. And then from there, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of look nearby. Right? So we've created our shadow manifold. We're going to find for a point in time, so let's say this is the point in time we care about, we're going to look what are the nearby points on the manifold to, to the point that we care about. Note how those points don't have to be necessarily sim similar in time. Right, so they could be from very different times, but they're places where you sort of go around and then might come back to near the same spot. So you're going to make an average average within neighborhood in um, MXI. And now what you're going to do is, and you're going to keep track of, sorry, not going to average here, you're going to find points. Right, so you're going to find all those points nearby to you. Say you, you pick your, usually you pick d plus 1, where d is the number of dimensions. And then what you'll go is you'll find, you'll take all those points in here, and you'll say, where were those points and this other manifold that was created on, from, from this other manifold's delay embedding. Right. So now what you're going to do is average. So if these are our sets of points P, we're going to average We're going to average our values in M, X, J and average those over the points that we had. And actually, you're going to do a weighted average, but that's the general idea. And ideally, if this is a one-to-one -one mapping, this should give you sort of an estimate as to what you would expect xj to be from, x, from xi. Right, so based off of your values in xi, this gives you a predicted value of what you would expect xj to be doing. And then you can, just you can do this for all your points. And then you can just basically measure what's your r squared between your actual values of xj and your estimated values of xj. And if things have gone well, you get a nice line. And so you can measure, essentially, predictability. I think, what did I use? Is is your correlation coefficient, and this is xj, 
or X, we'll say, we'll call this xi to xj. So whether xi is able to predict xj. Right. Let's just pause for a second. Are there, are there, are there any questions? I mean, that's, always, that's going to be a choice. I'm going to, I mean, again, I'm suggesting something we haven't really done very much with. I'm just sort of trying to get the, get the juices flowing of something. Right, yeah, so we're going to be short, relatively, like, we'll talk about time scales on the order of minutes is roughly what we're going to be measuring. So let's say in a, like a three-minute span, can you predict what the other animal is doing or, or so on, right? So not over days, right, because obviously at some limit it's going to be useless. OK, so now we have this. And now simply all we're going to do is for each point in time, we can say we can calculate cx goes to y. And we're just going to add them, cy goes plus cy goes to x. Right, so this is, again, we don't care who's interacting with whom. We just care that there's an interaction happening. The, the second thing is another whole thing. And part of why we're doing this, this is a more robust measurement than any of the individual measurements. So we're just saying, is there something happening? And then 6 will compare to a ghost pair. And that ghost pair is exactly what I was referring to before, which is you take two animals that are in the same apparatus, but they're not actually in the same apparatus at the same time. So ideally, you would, we would hope that this means that there's no interaction. And the hope is that this will take care of any sort of time, timing effects, because maybe there's some weird thing where the animals always do the same thing if they're, in the, if they're in the arena for some amount of time together, or even not even together. And so we're going to do this and compare it to a ghost pair and see what you can get. Um, now, the problem that we have is we don't have a continuous dynamical system, the way we've usually been referring to things. We could have done this with the posture modes, but for a lot of technical reasons that I was talking about with Greg's group yesterday, this is, winds up being rather difficult. So we're going to rely on the same trick that we used yesterday. And we're going to take these sequences, but now instead of with the, instead of with the, with the fruit flies, we're going to take a, bunch of prairie, a couple of prairie voles. So these are, I've mentioned these animals before, but these are animals that form monogamous pair bonds. You can put them in together, and you can measure what their behavior is doing. And you can actually try and measure this quantity. And so doing, we basically make behavioral spaces. And we put each animal in the behavioral space. And we, just like yesterday, we're going to make a recurrent neural net to try and fit these structures. And for the standpoint of our arguments today, just because I want to show you something stupid, let's just take a PCA of the neuron values inside of this and look to see, which is giving us a one-dimensional time series from each recurrent neural network. So I have one dynamical system describing what one vole is doing. I have a different one-dimensional dynamical system describing what the other vole is doing. And let's just, let's just, see, let's just see what we can do. Right? We can compute this quantity. And this is just looking at one uh, uh, three-hour window. And you can compute what we call the sort of interaction index, which, again, is Maybe not so much better than the sort of intuitive courtship index things that people were having, but at least it's an attempt. And so you can see this is, the, since I've subtracted off, zero would mean that it's exactly the same as what the ghost pair is doing. Positive means that it's, there's more interaction. And you can sort of get these epics in these regions of statistical significance. Don't ask me what the negative regions really are, although it doesn't really look like there's any ones that are significantly negative. Um, but, they're, like they're act, they're, um, but you can see sort of, you get these sort of regions in time. And then once you have those regions, you can say, like, the dumbest thing I could think of when I was doing this was you could say, for example, which regions are enriched when you're in these interaction regions, and then focus in on those behaviors as a way of sort of trying to study it. Again, I don't want to make too much of this. This is my sort of weird sort of amused musings on uh, maybe what's one way of thinking about predictability. There probably are many, much, much better ways. But the point is, like, this is the amount of work on the structure and how sort of the fact that I'm up here talking about random stuff that I don't know how it works I w is more, probably more valuable than anything I actually said, <laughs> right? <laughs> the fact that there's, this is something where I think it is really 
when we have the next Boulder School, hopefully not 12 years from now, but uh, <laughs> um, the, this is, I think this is going to be something where we're going to see a lot of progress between now and then. And so I think this is an area I wanted to talk about a bit precisely because of that, because we don't know anything now, but there's a lot of people all trying to work together, converging towards better solutions on it. Um, and lastly, sort of I wanted to get a bit more towards philosophical, since I've got an extra five minutes to blather on for a bit. Right. Uh, and so, so the question is, sort of when we're thinking about behavior, what sort of theory do we want to have? Right. So, I mean, this, this is something that, that bothers a lot of us. Like, we have these biological systems in general. They're very, very complicated. Sometimes, if you can set up your problem very nicely, like, you see, like you've seen in a lot of Andrew's pro, uh, lectures, you can actually write down a lot of very clean equations. They're maybe messy to solve, but the, the, the setup is clean. Right? And, and then from that setup, you can actually make predictions which can then be validated in an experiment. And this is what we generally like doing. Right? And then there's a wrong, and then you go and make another model, and you keep on working, and you iterate these things. Right? So the ones Andrew told you about are actually right. So that's, that's always nice. <laughs> um, but so what would that theory look like? And so let's sort of try and think about sort of this experimental theory relationship a little bit just in the last few minutes here. So, like, this is also a really messy data set. Right, so this is, a, this is one of the Higgs boson events from, uh, from the Atlas detector. Um, and so you can see these four red lines coming out, or what they call the four muon golden signature that everyone was always looking for, basically trying to see that you actually can get this production, that you can see this thing. But there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on in here. Right? So if you were to look at this without much of a theory, you would be pretty lost. Right? And in fact, it's even a stronger statement than that is that you wouldn't have even built it like this without the theory. Right? So in fact, what you do is you build a detector in this sort of ways, which have these very precise things, because some very good phenomenologists can go and predict you should see various types of signal significance in these different channels, because we wrote down a bunch of Feynman diagrams talking about these sorts of things. And we said, oh, if we're in this mass range, we should see this decay off into four muons in this nice way. And so we, we should make sure that we should have a nice coverage of these muon detectors on the outside. I just talk about this example because way back when I was an undergrad, I spent a very long time calibrating probably this guy over here. <laughs> so, so, but I mean, but here, here's sort of one sense that we have for what, how theory is useful, right? It tells us what experiments to do. And it tells us how to interpret the data once we have it. But that, that's not the only type of theory that we can necessarily want. And there's this question about in behavior, whether this is, whether this is a reasonable expectation. Because, our, because this underlying system and the structure might be so complicated that this type of simple picture doesn't emerge. The other way that you can think about it, and this is, sort of, this is me outside of uh, taking pictures outside of the uh, Chimpali mode in Lisbon. Seeing this, is that you can sort of see, you can ask a simple question, right? So you have a fluid flow, and you can ask, what gives you that wave structure? Like, why do I see waves of that, of that height compared to waves of that height on the, on the right? And so you can imagine sort of the, the computer scientist, the machine learning approach is, we're going to just measure a bunch of this data. We're going to measure h, h of x and t, this height of x and time, and then and then some amount of environmental parameters. And then we're going to train a model to accurately predict x and t given e. And then we're going to correctly, uh, correctly output the future untrained x of x, t, and given e. Right? This is, and to a lot of people in machine learning, this is a successful theory. Right? You don't necessarily know what these arrows are or how, how, they, how to interpret them. But this is another way that people would think about it. But you could also take the same data and think about it more sort of like a physicist applied mathematician approach and say, well, we have some symmetries that we want to preserve. So that gives us the Navier-Stokes equations, right? Just conserve mass and momentum. And now let's say, well, listen, we're going to make some assumptions and say that the, in reality, the, the depth is very, is very large. And so we have some shallow water approximation. And so if you go and make those assumptions, you can rewrite those complicated equations by this much simpler thing. And then you can linearize it, and then that gives you a nice relationship between external parameters of the world and what that wave production is. Right? And so those are the sort of, at least as a physicist, make me a little happier. But it's not necessarily to say they're better, but 
for behavior, so this is sort of what most of what I've talked and what most other people talk about when they talk about behavior is you have some complicated distribution, you're trying to fit it, you're trying to use that to make predictions. But that in some ways isn't necessarily sort of the structure and the way that we want to talk about it. And in reality, sort of what I think has been the most important thing when I've been thinking about behavior is the notion of dynamics. But that's not how most people, when they're talking about it, if you talk to most people that are studying, particularly thinking about structure and the temporal dependence of behavior, the analogy they like to give is something more like this, like language, right? You have, which is very hierarchical in a particular way. Right? You have a book, inside that book you have chapters, you have a paragraph, and you have a sentence. Inside that sentence you have very, you have very particular rules over how, over how these sentences must be structured, and in, the, in some sense that one sentence might predict the next sentence, and so on but you have this sort of hierarchical branching process where you can sort of create this. But what I would argue is this isn't a great analogy either. Because in some ways, this is, you're only in one paragraph at a time. Right? You're, you're only in one chapter, you're only in one sentence. And what I think, and from all the stuff that I've shown, hopefully I have some degree of convincing, that a lot of what we see from behavior is more related to a bunch of dynamic things interacting and fighting with each other and trying and modulating these end outputs, right? We're only measuring the young man ate his hamburger quickly, but those would be, say, like the behavioral sequences we're seeing at the end or the postural movements. But in reality, there's a whole set of complicated structures which might emerge that. And so for that, I'm going to indulge myself for a moment. Yes, Elia. <laughs> No, my complaint is that we're, hung we're hungry and tired at the same time. That's my complaint, right? That's my, it's not, it's not about the, it's not about the, the low level states, it's about the high level ones. Right. So in some ways, and I'm gonna just bear with me for a second. I think actually that in some ways music theory is a better way of talking about it. And don't worry if none of this make, if you haven't seen anything before, what I'm gonna talk about should be relatively straightforward is you look at a piano, and, well, let's say you look at a symphony, right? A symphony, like a book, like behavior, has this long time scale structure, often stereotyped, sometimes not. And you can say, okay, you have a tonic key, a second key, it does some crazy modulations, it goes back to the first key, recapitulates stuff. It, there, there's a, it's a genre, right? But as you move around, right, and as you move through these things, you have this very high level, and then you have these very sort of intermediate level sort of harmonic structures, which are all sort of interacting with each other. And this in some ways results. So if you put your hands on a keyboard, you have the key of C, right? Everything's on a white key. Then you have the key of G. Everything's on a white key except this one thing up here. If I'm, if I'm never playing this key or this key, you don't know what key you're in. There's a latent factor which is generating what structures and which, and which behaviors you're doing. But if you're observing it, unless you hear this note or you hear this note, you don't know where you are. And the best composers will use this to great effect. In fact, once you start hearing this note, this is what sends you from G, from C to G. And sort of this sets this overall structure where you move from chord to chord based off of which chords are only one note different, or which keys are only one note different. And overall, you have this latent structure which moves these aspects, which is governed by these higher things, and they all sort of can fight against each other in this counterpoint of different ideas. And to me, I think that's what the theory of behavior probably is going to wind up looking like as we develop things. Is how do we understand what are these sort of hidden factors moving and modulating the things that we can actually measure directly? And the hope is that we can make some progress and that some of that's been shared. And thank you. Well, it's, okay, so basically what you did is you we took the LSTM, and then essentially what we did is we took the node values, so whatever, 128 nodes, we just did a PCA and took the, first pro the time series of the first projection. Ideally, if it's Tokens, it shouldn't matter which projection we pick, <coughs> right? <laughs> I could have ideally just picked one neuron, but there's some technical problems with that. Right, did, that did that answer it? It's not a huge amount of structure. So.
say. That just was, again, I was trying to think about what a good zero would be, and that was the best I could come up with. And that, the ghost background, what was nice, it actually was the same animals in a different experiment. So that even was controlling for the fact that those were those animals. Well, I mean, I can, I, can give you the, I can give you the intellectual answer and the practical answer. The intellectual answer is they have a very robust social behavior in which, they, in which they form these social bonds which last a long period of time. The more practical answer is the NIH gave us money. <laughs> but, but, but not honestly, the, 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 the rationale is try, this is, this is a, two things where you expect a very strong social interaction to occur. And so if, if you aren't able to see it in here, you're probably not going to be able to see it in other more subtle systems. That, that, that's the more honest, that, that's probably the more honest intellectual thing. But the practical thing is not negligible either. Yes. Yeah. 